Hello and welcome to Bun Med, where we discuss concise medical knowledge that you can fit inside of a bun. In this video, we're going to be having a look at disseminated intravascular coagulation. So what does disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC, refer to? Well, disseminated refers to all over the body. Intravascular means inside of our vessels, and coagulation obviously means clots. So therefore, we have lots and lots of clots spread all over our body. So let's now break down DIC to find out how it may occur and what we may see in DIC and how we may go on to treat it. So in DIC, we have interaction, a very, very complex interaction between some causative factors. And this could include things like sepsis, pregnancy, malignancy, specifically in this form of acute uh, myeloid leukemia known as the acute premyelocytic leukemia, where we have a 1517 translocation or trauma. And essentially, the interaction between these causative factors goes on to inappropriately activate our extrinsic pathway. So essentially, we get activation of tissue factor of factor 3 into factor 3A, setting off the extrinsic pathway inappropriately, and therefore we end up producing lots and lots of thrombin. Now, if you remember about the clotting cascade, that this, this increase in the thrombin boost can actually boost the activity of the intrinsic pathway. And therefore, we end up producing lots and lots of uh, uncontrolled clots all over our body. So what actually is disseminated intravascular coagulation? Well, it's the uncontrolled formation of clots all over our body. And because we are getting the formation of these clots, we are using up our clotting factors. But not only that, we're using up our platelets as well, as this fibrant sheath formed is very sticky and it will grab onto platelets nearby. So therefore, we become deficient in not only our clotting factors, but also our platelets. So both our primary and our secondary hemostasis is impaired. Now, if you remember, these platelet clots can be very, very sharp due to the fibrin sheath. So therefore, any red cell that passes through it might get sheared in half. So this is a form of a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Now you can see we've actually set up a very, very interesting uh, paradigm here where we are at a very high risk of bleeding because we've used up all of our clotting factors and we've used up a lot of our platelets. Yet at the same time, we're at a very, very high risk of clotting as well as these clots can get deposited anywhere in the body and cause a local infarct. So this is why DIC is a true medical emergency. So what sort of symptoms may we see in a patient with DIC? Well, obviously, we're going to have uh, the presence of one of the risk factors or the causes that we've discussed before. Symptoms that we may see in patients who are at a higher risk of bleeding or life-threatening bleeding is things like oozing from venipuncture sites, so where they've had blood taken before they start spontaneously bleeding from them. Spontaneous bleeding from other sites, such as the gum or the nose. And if, we, if they are at a higher risk of clotting, these clots can get deposited in places like our hands or our feet, leading to pale feet or digital infarcts, where one of our digits um, gets killed off by the clot blocking the arteries off. Or we may get things like circulatory collapse, shown by hypotension and tachycardia. So what kind of investigations would we want to do in someone who we suspect has disseminated intravascular coagulation? Well, the first thing, like in most uh, bleeding disorders, we want to do is a full blood count. And in DIC, we tend to see a thrombocytopenia because we remember we've used up the uh, platelets by sticking them to all the uncontrolled fibrin clots that are being formed. And we see a normocytic anemia because our red cells are simply being sheared because of the sh uh, sharp fibrin sheaths. The next thing that we want to do is a blood film, and on a blood film we see this thing called schistocytosis, which essentially means shared uh, red cells or cut up red cells. The next thing we may want to do is monitor the impact of the kidneys as these clots can get deposited in the kidneys. And DIC can lead to something known as acute kidney injury, where we may see things like raised urea and creatinine. Another thing that we of course want to do is check the action of our um, clotting cascade, and we do this by doing some clotting studies. Now, what might we see on clotting studies? Well, we're going to see a raised bleeding time because we've used up all our platelets and therefore uh, we've uh, impacted primary hemostasis. And we're going to see a raised PT and a raised APTT as we've used up clotting factors from both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway. So the classic picture for someone with DIC is to have a prolonged bleeding time, PT and APTT.
As a quick side note, just to say that bleeding time is no longer used as a test clinically. I've put them on the slides as often question banks will refer to someone with a classical picture of DIC having a raised bleeding time as well. But just to reiterate, bleeding time is no longer used. However, if you see this on a question bank where all three are pro prolonged, it's likely to be DIC for that question. The next thing we want to do is a D-dimer. Essentially what a D-dimer is, is measuring how quickly uh, fibrin clots are broken down all over our body. Now, if you imagine if you're forming lots and lots of these clots, then we're going to be, the body is going to be trying to break these down as soon as possible. So we get a significantly raised D-dimer. And the last thing we may want to consider doing is checking the patient's fibrinogen status. Now, remember, because we are forming lots and lots of clots all over the body, the patient's fibrinogen status may be low. So what may we do to treat someone with DIC? Well, because it is a medical emergency, we're going to approach this with an A, B, C, D, E approach. So airway, breathing, circulation, disability, uh, and also exposure. The next thing we want to do is determine if this patient is having um, life-threatening bleeding. And if the patient is experiencing life-threatening bleeding and they're losing a lot of blood, then we have to replace the clotting factors that they've lost. And this could include things like providing fresh frozen plasma, which will uh, replenish all of the clotting factors that they've lost. Or it may include things like cryoprecipitate if they're experiencing life-threatening bleeding and the fibrinogen is very low, as our cryoprecipitate contains a high concentration of fibrinogen, as well as that things like uh, factor eight as well and von Willebrand's factor. And if our patient is not experiencing life-threatening bleeding or any bleeding, remember that they're at a significantly higher risk of clotting as these clots can get deposited anywhere in the body. So therefore, thromboprophylaxis may be used in those who are not bleeding. And lastly, of course, we have to treat the underlying cause and we may give patients supportive care. This could include things like uh, giving them fluids when they're fluid deficient or giving them oxygen if they're oxygen deficient. That concludes the video. Hope you guys found it useful. Please feel free to share and subscribe. And if you have any comments, leave them below and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. See you in the next one.